The fall. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream to be. Change has come to America. Believe it. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. We've told Mexico the tariffs go on, and I mean it too. And I'm very happy with it. And a lot of people, senators included, they have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to tariffs. They have no, absolutely no idea. When you have the money, when you have the product, when you have the thing that everybody wants, you're in a position to do very well with tariffs, and that's where we are. We're the piggy bank. The United States is the piggy bank. It has all the money that others want to take from us. Huh? But they're not taking it so easy anymore. It's a lot different. What? Our talks with China, a lot of interesting China. things are happening. We'll see what happens. We'll see. In the meantime, we're getting 25% on $250 billion, and I could go up another at least $300 billion. Oh. And I'll do that at the right time. Oh. But I think China wants to make a deal badly. I think Mexico wants to make a deal badly. And I'm going to Normandy. Believe me. Oh, my God. So here's where we are today. Today we are watching. Um, it is 4 o'clock, 4.07 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the show is live at that time and in this place. Uh, we are waiting until 5 o'clock. Why? Because at 5 o'clock, if the president is going to meet his own self-imposed, ridiculously doofus ill-conceived a uh, plan to increase tariffs on Mexico, uh, it will have to come in an executive order by five o'clock, close of business today. So I'm, uh, you know, sitting here waiting to see, you know, uh, will he or won't he? Now, you all know that if there's something incredibly stupid uh, that we're waiting to see if Trump will do, the question isn't really if, it's just when. And if it's not this one, this stupid idea, believe me, there's about a million more waiting in line uh, to get daylight. You know, the guy, he, in the chat room, they were talking about, uh, you know, Trump's been tweeting about how he wants to go to the moon again and then go on to Mars. And then he tweeted that the moon is so 50 years ago. And by the way, Mars is part of the moon. He's a genius, a stable, stable freaking genius. Ain't he, everybody? Ain't he? And the whole world is waiting with bated breath to see what this lunatic idiot is going to do. You know, he's, he's, and, and people from the Republican side are going, is he really this self destructive? He's not self destructive because the economy, uh, you know, is like the one bright spot because Obama fixed it. And, uh, you know, we talked last Friday on the uh, Randy Rhodes After Hours podcast, the free After Hours podcast that's part of the Sexy Liberal uh, Radio uh, Podcast Network. And so he was saying, and I was saying to him, uh, me and Austin were talking about whether or not we thought he would do this. And neither of us thought he would do this, but everybody else thinks he will. It's just me and Mr. Goolsby that thinks he will not do this. Uh, but, you know, uh, the guy, and they're saying, uh, well, is he really that self-destructive? Does he really want to destroy the one bright spot he has the economy? He's not self-destructive. He's us destructive. He hates this country, and he is out to destroy it. You know, I mean, he will survive. He always survives. He's In that way, he's the cockroach among us. Do you know what I mean? He d d Put it this way. The bull doesn't give a rat's ass about the china shop you get that the bull doesn't care about the china shop and we are there so he'll decide on the tariffs today and here we are holding our breath to see if the dumbest person in the world shares his decision with us before close of business today you know and if you have any if you have any questions if you are on the other side of where i sit okay if you believe everything i say is wrong okay can i just show you or point you to his outfit in england as evidence of his decision making skills can i just do that thank you uh so this urgent mess message is going to be delivered by the obese 
the morbidly obese runner. Now, if it, it, I mean, just just look at the pictures of him in that ill-conceived, ridiculous outfit that he chose, and then say to you, and look at his hair. I mean, what is it about? Everybody now ignores the fact that he's orange and that his hair is like a corn yellow, and that it's a you know sprayed in place. Co- Everybody ignores. I mean, just look at his decision making about his own damn self. Could you just look? You know, he's telling some exasperated hairdresser and some exasperated tailor, you know, that they don't, that, that he, he knows, uh, you know, the best way to do tailoring, right? That he's an expert on tailoring. He's an expert on hair doozies. I just, I don't know. He's, he's got a, a gut the size of a Stonehenge bluestone, and he's sitting there telling the tailor, no, I want it this way. You know, the man is an idiot. And by the way, here's the jobs report for it. You know, it's starting to take a toll. I, I just want to give you a little bit of math before I play you the CNN jobs report. Okay, here's how the math works on tariffs. So the middle class, middle income earners in this country from the ridiculous tax cut, from the giant transfer of wealth, from the middle class to the top, they saw about $930 in a tax cut over the year, okay? That's kind of what you got, $930 uh, last year. According to the Brookings Tax Policy Center, the tariffs already in effect against China have cost each American household, $831. You got $930, it cost you $831 to suffer through this man's, you know, I'm going to effing tax them 25% MFs, which I can't play, okay? Because people get really upset when they, uh, you know, hear the words. Uh, but that's what he said. Obviously, we all remember that, right? So you subtract what the household that you live in has paid already for his craziness, for his ill-thought-out, stupid tariffs, okay, against China, which he says he wants to increase now. And you realize that it costs you, you know, $831 for your household and that your household got maybe $930. Uh, you know, you got about $100 left of your massive, massive tax cut. But see... I didn't want to include the interest on the new debt he created by giving the very wealthy your money. Thought I'd take it easy on you. It is, uh, after all, Friday. All right, so now that you know, here's the jobs report. A really a really big stutter, I would say, in uh, the jobs market uh, here. Not uh, a lot of appetite for big companies to hire. Only 75,000 net new jobs oh God. created in the month of May. And what's interesting and troubling is the two prior months, which were nice and strong, they were revised lower, so another 75,000 jobs Minus. lopped off of there. So a little bit of a weaker spring than would be, we had been thinking of. Let me give you some context. Last year, on average, about 220,000 new jobs every month. This year, we're averaging about 169,000 new jobs. And in May, it was half of that. Oh, yeah. So something happened there to spook uh, employers. The unemployment rate, though, stays steady at 3.6%. You had about 176,000 people who left the labor market. So right. these, two, uh, these two different surveys, that's what they tell us. Among the sectors, business still strong, healthcare strong, construction only 4,000. That's a lot less than we've been seeing in the prior months. So a slowdown there in construction hiring is one of the reasons we're seeing this happen. Uh, futures, though, are up a little bit. And why? Because the market is counting on the fact that if the president's trade wars dent growth, hurt hiring, hurt the U.S. economy, the Fed will be forced to come in and cut interest rates. So there's a little bit of a, a safety net under investors right now because they think the Fed won't let President Trump sink the U.S. economy. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. So if you saw those numbers uh, that we just showed you that CNN posted on their screen, then you can see that in February we only added 56,000 jobs. And then in May, we only added 75,000 jobs. So, you know, another way to look at it is we've finally seen the last of Obama's job numbers because it looks like the United States has finally internalized the message that Donald Trump is the president and he's a buffoon. But thank you, Obama. Look how long uh, the economy, uh, you know, held up under, uh, you know, this buffoon. Look how, look how long it held up. It was a beauty. 
Now, Larry Kudlow once said that Trump's trade proposals will pose incalculable damage to the U.S. economy. Now he's in charge of it. All things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. I'm just saying, Mr. Trump, you got the wrong idea on protectionism and I think on immigration but from what I gather you've made statements and I heard a little bit of this in the debate you slap a 25-35% tariff on our leading trading partners like Mexico and China we may not like them sir but tariffs and protectionism is not the answer it will do incalculable damage to the American economy hmm Okay? Okay. We will cut off our nose to spite our face. And that is not the right policy. There you have it. The chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors to Donald Trump back then. Back then. On his little radio show there. Larry Kudlow saying you will cut your nose off to spite your face if you implement tariffs against our top trading partners i know you don't like them sir but you will be cutting off your nose to spite your face and now we're sitting here waiting for our rhinoplasty to begin with the scalpel in the hands of dr trump holy crap man so his own team i mean remember gary Cohn, who was the uh chief of the, the chairman of the he quit because of these tariffs he literally quit and we are paying them because that's how tariffs work when they when the, the items come in as soon as they come and land on our soil the importer of whatever it is has to pay the tax and then they pass that cost on to the purchaser of that item and so it's cost each and every household so far 831 dollars we're not even talking about avocados yet or automobiles and you know these automakers okay so here's what happens so mexico uh, you know will import you know uh, uh, the first parts to the of the car for instance the uh, like the harnesses that hold the wires and that's you know the first thing they install on the car you can't build the car without the harness right for the wires and so then they'll export the harness it will be put into the car maybe here in the united states somewhere okay and then it gets exported uh for some other part and then now the automakers are gonna have to pay the tariffs multiple times this is why the cost of an automobile would go up by thirteen hundred dollars Again, Larry Kudlow, uh, you know, all through the year of 2015 when Trump was campaigning and saying, I'll tax them, MFs. You know, I'm going to tax them 25%, you MFs, right? And it was cursing up. And people were like, yeah, strong and wrong is what I'm all about, right? Kudlow was on his radio show saying, "Uh, I think he's gone too far with this immigration thing. I don't think it's very smart. And why are we penalizing Mexico for stuff that's going on in the Northern Triangle, Mexico is Mexico, and then you have Central America below it. Even he understood this is like attacking Iraq because the Saudis, uh, you know, uh, uh, launched uh, uh, airplanes against us and, and flew them into the World Trade Center. It makes no sense. He is not a conservative, or if he is, he's hiding it. He's and- hiding it. Um, this anti-immigration thing has gone way too far. For example, all right, yeah. we'll take a break, but let me just get this in. For yeah, example, get this in. Donald Trump is blaming the government of Mexico several times for you know sending us these terrible people. First of all, the government of Mexico has nothing to do with sending us anybody. Now, you Hello. could talk about the drug cartels and other things. Most people come here for economic reasons, but mm-hmm. yes, there are some terrible bad apples uh, regarding the drug cartels and what happened in San Francisco is a, is a tragedy and a travesty. Okay, get that. But it's not the government of Mexico. <laughs> Let's remember this before we get so protectionist. The United States and Mexico have very close relations. They're an important partner. They are our second biggest export market, right, right. our third biggest trading market after Canada and Japan and China, rather, and literally, literally. Millions of Americans 
go to Mexico for tourism and vacation and, and millions of American retirees live in Mexico because it's cheaper and rather pleasant. He's a jackass. Uh, the president is a jackass, and he's doing this because uh, he thinks that he can do this under his emergency powers. Okay, here's a little history lesson. Emergency powers have never, ever, not once, ever been used to give the president the authority to, uh, to, to invoke tariffs. Now, if you, if you are upset about the drug trade or cartels or, you know, um, the, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, commerce that comes over the border at the legal ports of entry, the president could, he could, sanction those individuals whose bank accounts clearly identify them as being beneficiaries of drug cartels. But he cannot attack the government of Mexico with tariffs and ask us to pay for them with emergency powers. It's never been done. If he does it today, it will be the first time ever. And, and, and the reason is very clear. It's the Constitution that he likes to poop all over, okay? That, that document, that piece of paper that he finds really inconvenient, that's what he's pooping on, okay? Uh, the Constitution, clearly in Article 1, gives the authority of tariffs and taxation to Congress. And there is no such thing as a president having emergency powers uh, to, uh, to, 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 to assign tariffs to a government. It's never, ever, ever happened. This is what we're waiting to see. If, 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 if he thinks that his emergency powers, by the way, what are... What is, what is an emergency and why do we have emergency powers for the president? Okay, so an emergency is a, a situation that requires a quick response. He's been campaigning on this since 2015. This is like four years now, not an emergency. It doesn't require a quick response doesn't require a quick response. Therefore, he cannot use emergency powers for anything. It's unorthodox. It makes no sense. And here he is saying that he's going to uh, put a tax on everything from auto parts to food. Auto parts to food with an executive order. Now, what you're talking about is a marketplace between us and Mexico where we export to Mexico almost $300 billion worth of goods. We import from Mexico about $370 billion worth of goods. That is an unusual place to seek to remedy an emergency by ruining the economy of both countries. It makes no sense. The law, the emergency powers that the president is claiming for himself to enhance his authority to bypass Congress do not exist, okay? Those powers do not exist. And destroying Mexico's economy and destroying our economy isn't a solution to a pressing current problem. Ted Cruz is livid, man, because the cost to Texas alone, $30 billion. And Ted Cruz, he's all, he's all strong now. Oh, yeah, you could trash his wife and he'll call you a sniveling coward and say, leave Heidi alone. But, you know, otherwise, he's on board with every crazy, insane thing that you've done, including getting help and taking help from a foreign adversary's military intelligence units, right? But now he says, there's no reason for Texas farmers and ranchers and manufacturers and small businesses to pay the price of massive new taxes. Yeah, he, he's growing something there. Call in, connect. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. The Trump downside is protectionism. In the book, he wants a 20% on all imported goods. That will kill consumers and businesses. Huh. He has threatened a 35% tax on Ford vehicles made in Mexico and brought back to the U.S., and he's hinted at a 25% tariff on goods coming here from China. Protectionism, higher tariffs, are higher taxes, and anti-growth. 
There he is, Larry Kudlow, everybody, in 2015, and Trump is now declaring uh, an emergency, something that needs immediate attention, something that's you know uh, uh, requires him to use his emergency power to tax us, to tax us, so that all that's left from the average family's big ass tax cut is nine uh, is a uh, hundred dollars, a hundred dollars. That's what you got. I mean, it's just so wrong. Everything about him is so wrong. And, you know, he stands there and stands there and stands there. And he says, senators know nothing about tariffs. Well, you know, it is the uh, legislative branch that actually does trade and tariffs and and, 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 and will have to, um, you know, vote to confirm his uh you know uh his new nafta or whatever umska or whatever he's calling it okay and i mean who would trust him his word means absolutely nothing so this is just bizarre and then he stands up there and you go oh they, they know nothing about tariffs i know about tariffs. i know we're about having it. a great talk with mexico we'll see what happens we'll see what happens but uh, something pretty dramatic could happen uh, we've told mexico the tariffs go on and i mean it too and i'm very happy with it and a lot of people, senators included, they have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to tariffs. They what? Have no, absolutely no idea. When you have the money, when you have the product, when you have the thing that everybody wants, you're in a position to do very well with tariffs, and that's where we are. I want an avocado. That's what I want. I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's just, it's crazy. The auto industry is is freaking out. I mean, you know, the the GOP is speaking out against him. What do you think of Republicans who say that they may take action to block you imposing those tariffs? No, oh, I don't think they will do that. I think if they do, it's foolish. Foolish. CNN's Phil Manningly is on Capitol Hill. Phil, what are you hearing from Republicans after this meeting? Yeah, one Republican senator who walked out of the meeting told me, Jake, it was a brushback pitch, a warning to the administration not to go through with the tariffs. Take a listen to how some other senators characterize it. Yeah, I think it's a mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying we don't have a crisis on the border. We do, clearly. Uh, I'm not saying um, it won't work, at least short term. My concern... It, um, has to do with the long-term ramifications. I think it's safe to say you've talked to all of our members. We're not fans of tariffs. We're still hoping that this can be avoided. That's a key uh, word there from Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Jake. They hope this can be avoided. Essentially, that's the strategy right now. Hope and pray the president doesn't actually implement those tariffs. If he does, Republicans say they're willing to potentially vote to block them. But at least at this point, before they're actually implemented, right now, they're pretty much relying on just hope, Jake. All right, so here's what the uh, Senate could do. Uh, They could veto uh, his tariffs. They could actually uh, introduce a resolution of disapproval, is what it's called. Isn't that something? And uh, then, of course, the president would uh, veto their resolution of disapproval. And he would then need, uh, the, the Senate would then need 67 uh, votes and the house as well th- uh, we need three quarters of the house and and three quarters of the senate to override his veto uh and they would be forced to publicly rebuke uh their uh their hero you know their man and i uh, i don't know that they would have 67 votes i mean the same thing happened with the saudi transfer of weapons right uh they voted not to allow it and then he vetoed trump vetoed it and they don't have the 67 to override the veto i mean it's just so it's so sick i mean we have a president who wants to sell seven billion dollars in arms to saudi arabia he wants to give it to the united arab emirates uh you know and he was stopped by uh, the senate last year uh they 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 actually invoked a provision of the arms export control act of 1976 uh and uh you know uh Trump vetoed it. So, you know, I I, I don't know what's next. The Insurrection Act of 1807 to use federal troops to enforce the border. I don't know. I don't know. All I can tell you is he's an idiot and we are suffering because he's a lunatic moron. Okay. I mean, Elizabeth Warren, she had a really good town hall this week and she's trying to explain to you that giant corporations have zero loyalty to the united states of america they're multinationals they go where the profit is they you know whatever whatever it is that you know you seek to do can we can we not look to corporations to solve the problem can we can we just say that's not the answer to anything 
But people in Fort Wayne, Indiana also understand that leaving it to a handful of giant multinational corporations to build our economy just didn't work. You know, those big corporations, they don't have any loyalty to America. They don't have any loyalty to American workers. They have loyalty to exactly one thing, and that is their own profits. And what we've got to do is we've got to have a government that doesn't say, hey, whatever it is that the giant multinational corporations want, let us help you. We've got to have a government that says we need this economy, we need this country to work for working people, and that's what we're going to do. Honestly, it makes no sense, you know? It really makes no sense, because if he puts tariffs on, the automakers are simply going to pass the cost on to you, the auto buyer. The auto industry knows that. They absolutely are, 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 you know, understand what's going to happen, because they're going to be taxed multiple times as these parts go back and forth. President Trump says he has no plans to abandon his threat to impose tariffs on Mexico over immigration, even in the face of growing Republican opposition. Now, if those tariffs reach 25 percent by October, there could be a crippling cost to car buyers, sellers and automakers. Erica Hill is live in Detroit, where they are watching this so closely, Erica. John, there are some estimates that even that just that 5% tariff on auto parts could increase the cost of a new car by some $1,300. So that, of course, begs the question, what will it do to jobs? Well, like many these days, that question depends on who you ask. A proud third-generation Chrysler employee, Chris Vitale works on the engines of the future. I am the engineer's hands. I put things together. For years, politicians have campaigned for the support of the country's nearly one million auto workers. Now their future is linked to immigration and the president's push for stronger borders. I feel like he wouldn't have to resort to that if we had a Senate and a Congress that would enforce the borders. Vitale, who voted for Obama twice, supports President Trump and his tactics. People have endured much worse than expensive avocados or a few more dollars here and there, you know, to protect the country. And I think that this, oh is, my God. this is valid, what he's doing. I think it's the wrong way to go about doing it. It makes us look awful in the eyes of the world. And quite honestly, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. Too. What does immigration have to do with the economy and the jobs? Well, if you do it Trump's way, yes, people will lose their jobs because of immigration. Isn't that something? Not because immigrants are taking your job, but because tariffs will price your goods out of the market and the company will fire you. So he's live on RandyRhodes.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Look, there are so many reasons why this is a wrong-headed proposal. As Erica just pointed out, um, consumers are probably going to bear the brunt of this. If, if you look at past tariffs that this president has already imposed, um, 100% of the costs are, of those t- tariffs, which are taxes, by the way, have been passed along to Americans. So it's going to raise the prices for American consumers. It's going to d- uh, screw up American supply chains, including in the automotive industry, which is already quite vulnerable right now, by the way. Uh, they've announced more layoffs in the auto industry in the first four year, excuse me, first four months of this year um, in like a decade um, or, or at least several years in any case. So uh, so the auto industry is already vulnerable. Um, lots of other manufacturing um, sectors also depend on basically unfettered trade across the Mexican border. And of course, there are other issues here, including that um, this is going to um, uh, mess with our ability to credibly negotiate with China, right? We just signed a new NAFTA deal with Mexico and yet went back on our word and decided to impose new tariffs. And of course, also, if we manage to wreck the Mexican economy, it's going to increase the flow of immigration. Right. So that makes no sense to anybody except uh, to Donald Trump, who thought he looked good in that tuxedo. OK, yeah. I'm just saying, I mean, the, 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 he thinks his hair is normal. He thinks that you know, he, he looks good. 
the the whole situation is just untenable and the economy is decelerating okay uh the number of jobs uh, is getting very sketchy now you know you had 56,000 jobs created in february they said oh, okay that's just one bad month and then uh, march and april they looked okay but they just downgraded those numbers they took uh you know uh, those numbers down by 75,000 and then you have the may job creation numbers and all that we've created is 75 Five thousand new jobs in this economy, and uh, you know it's 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 decelerating, obviously. And the people who are getting hurt, right, are the people who build things, manufacturing. That's where the job losses are coming from. That's where the sluggishness is. It's in the manufacturing sector. Okay, and so you have Democratic candidates that are out on the trail, understanding the economy, understanding about you know manufacturing, and understanding that. We've got a global crisis known as climate change that could be solved with a investment, a large investment into renewable fuels to get us away from fossil fuels, to make what the Saudis have, what the Iranians have worthless. It accomplishes so many goals to invest in renewables that it's almost mind blowing how it's staring everybody in the face, right? It's just right there. It's a plan that could be, you know, a uh, 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 launched and it would benefit manufacturers it would benefit the air it would benefit the water i mean today michael bloomberg you know he's a multi-billionaire he just invested 500 million half a billion half a billion dollars in making fossil fuels history by investing in clean renewable energy that's a person who puts their money where their mouth is i mean that's just amazing that's his personal fortune and he has partnered with the oh and by the way you know biden put out his climate change plan well good for him except that there's a little issue with did he copy and paste did he copy and paste other people's ideas listen i mean you know i, I i'm waiting you know the the deadline to sign his executive order uh is like nine minutes away from what i can tell and uh, you know i i don't see anything happening right this minute i guess we'll know after the break but after the break see i wanted to put this in the second hour so that the unfriendlies would not be here because you know friday we post the whole show for free and, uh, you know, uh, we just do it so people can learn about the world in which they live in. Uh, and so I don't like putting these kinds of um, intra-family arguments in the front of the show on a Friday. Because I don't need the trolls. You know what I mean? Uh, weighing in on our family arguments. And this is a family argument that we have to have in the Democratic Party. Looks like you know, Joe Biden had a very bad week. OK, first, he skipped the California convention. He didn't show up. That was one. And then he put out his energy plan, his clean energy plan, his Green New Deal plan. And it turned out that it, it, he lifted it. OK, he copied and pasted from some organizations that focus on climate change change and how to abate it and how to invest in America and how to invest in American jobs. And Elizabeth Warren was very clear about her ideas for, for Green New Deal. It's a $23 trillion market that we can actually provide the products for, that we can actually invest research and development money into and require anybody who takes our research and development and uses it, deploys it, that they produce the items, the, uh, you know, uh, the objects, whether it's solar panels or wind turbines or whatever, you know, route we go, uh, algae, okay, to, to make uh, energy, that they produce those jobs here, all right? And then all of a sudden, there was this report about Biden put out his green energy plan. Biden embraced parts of the Green New Deal, which has become a litmus test uh, for many of these 2020 Democratic candidates. He called the Green New Deal a crucial framework for f combating climate change and said that he aimed to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions by uh, 2050. But then they did run into a little bit of trouble when it came to the actual plan that was released itself, when it was revealed that some passages in that plan bore similar language to uh, proposals that had been put forth by progressive organizations, either on their websites or in letters. And the Biden campaign uh, said that as soon as they realized that some of these citations 
provisions were missing, that they work to quickly amend that in their plan. But of course, to put a little context on this, as you mentioned, Biden's first presidential campaign back in the 1988 race was derailed by charges of plagiarism, both on the campaign trail and also during his time in law school. Is this a problem for you? I just want to know. I mean, the idea that he embraces a Green New Deal, the idea that he understands that it's a $23 trillion market uh, uh, for products, for, you know, uh, uh, renewables, for turbines, which use all kinds of parts, bearings and, uh, you know, uh, uh, cogs and, you know, everything. Uh, The idea that he knows that, that he's embracing that, that he's for it is good. The idea that he doesn't give credit to the people who are d- literally devising policy plans and legislation and, you know, ways to deploy and protect our research and development dollars, where the money should come from. You know, uh, Elizabeth Warren's very clear about a wealth tax. And it's, it's just an amazing number when you think about it. If you if you actually employed or deployed a wealth tax, a wealth tax against the 75 75,000 of the richest, richest families in the United States. It's a tiny little thing. 75,000 of the richest families in the United States. I I, I forget what the threshold is. It's either 10 billion or 50 billion. Okay, and you deployed a wealth tax. It would raise $2 trillion over 10 years. And that's the entire investment for the Green New Deal. Okay, so Biden puts out his plan and he leaves out the citations. He f- doesn't give credit to the brainiacs who thought up a way to pay for the investment. So that was one thing. Now over the weekend, uh, there's this big thing in Iowa. He's skipping that too. He's not going to show up in Iowa. And also there was this contretemps over something called the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment is an old amendment from the 70s that says, it was right after Roe v. Wade, that says that if you get Medicaid or Medicare, that you can't use that, which is really your money that you paid in uh, for, you know, retirement or, God forbid, you know, you go belly up and you need health insurance, right? And you're below the poverty line. But they passed this Hyde Amendment said no federal funds can go to pay for abortion, right? And Joe Biden has been for the Hyde Amendment since the Hyde Amendment. I mean, the guy's been on, he, he's, he's been political, you know, I mean, Biden's been around for, oh God, this is hard to say. He started his political career 50 years ago. 50 years ago, south of the Mason-Dixon line, Right? But he's willing to say now circumstances have changed and now he's for the Hyde Amendment. But it's really interesting because this week he was asked a question by a woman who said she was a a volunteer for the ACLU in an open format. And she asked him if he was still for the Hyde Amendment. He said, no, no, it can't stay. Then his campaign put out a clarification saying he misunderstood the question. He thought she was asking about the Mexico City policy. And no, he's still for the Hyde Amendment because he's a very religious Roman Catholic. And he doesn't think that the federal government should pay for abortion. And then yesterday, the campaign said, oh no, oh no, he's for getting rid of the Hyde Amendment. Now... He's been in politics for half a century, which is longer than some of the political rivals of his have been on the planet. Is he a mess or is this progress? The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. A radio beacon to radio beacon. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's hey! a figment of your imagination. Randy Roach Show. Turn up your mind. There was an interesting thing that happened today that the 
former Vice President Joe Biden, mm -hmm. um, came out and said that he would not support repealing the Hyde Amendment. That is a provision of federal law that bars the federal government from funding abortion services through Medicare, Medicaid, and others. Um, you disagree with that position. Yes, I do. Uh, is Joe Biden wrong? Yes. Oh so why, why is he wrong? Here's how I look at this. I've, I've lived in America where abortions were illegal. Yeah. And understand this, women still got abortions. Now, some got lucky on what happened and some got really unlucky on what happened. But the bottom line is they were there. And under the Hyde Amendment, under every one of these efforts to try to chip away or to push back or to get rid of Roe versus Wade, understand this, women of means, will still have access to abortions. Who won't will be poor women, will be working women, will be women who can't afford to take off three days from work, will be very young women, will be women who've been raped, will be women who have been molested by someone in their own family. We do not pass laws that take away that freedom from the women who are most vulnerable. I mean, you could hear the passion in her voice. She can almost not catch her breath. That's how angry she is at the idea that uh, Joe Biden refused to throw his support behind repealing the stupid Hyde Amendment that's been, uh, you know, with us since uh, the 70s. Now, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, she tweeted, reproductive rights are human rights, period. They should be non-negotiable for all Democrats. Bernie Sanders of Vermont, he took a, a, a thinly veiled swipe. He said, uh, there is no middle ground on women's rights. Abortion is a constitutional right. Under my Medicare for All plan, we will repeal the Hyde Amendment. Kamala Harris tweeted, no women's access to reproductive health care should be based on how much money she has. We must repeal the Hyde Amendment. You get the idea, right? The entire lineup of Democratic uh, candidates had all struck against Joe Biden without really naming him, uh, you know, specifically, but obviously referring to him being the outlier, the only candidate and the front runner at this point. Uh, for the Democratic nomination for president for 2020. Uh, so all of a sudden, you know, uh, the, the Biden sent out a spokesperson uh, for the campaign to CNN to explain to the audience that the reason why Biden was for, for the Hyde Amendment is because he was a very devout Roman Catholic and he did not believe that other people should pay for abortions if they weren't for it. When it was pointed out that only the economically less better situated would be penalized and have been penalized because, you know, wealthy women are always going to have access to abortion, even if they have to fly to, you know, uh, Europe, even if they have to go to Canada, right? I mean, they'll always be able to... Elliot Briotti's mistress is always going to have money and a way to have her abortion safely and medically. It's going to be poor women. It's going to be women of color. It's going to be women who uh, can't take three days off of work. It's... I don't know why you'd need three days. I mean, I, I, had, I, I had an abortion, you know, last week on the air. I, I could have another one right now for... A, there, I had one. I mean, I don't know, but uh, you know, so, thank you. Uh, and so, yes, I'm a multitasker. So then all of a sudden, Biden flip-flopped. It was just a little over 24 hours ago where the Biden campaign confirmed that the former vice president did, in fact, uh, support the Hyde Amendment. You saw these uh, Democratic candidates, a large group of them, really come out and criticize Biden immediately, really exposing one of the first major fault lines uh, between Biden and the other Democrats in the 2020 field. But today here in Atlanta, just inside this room next to me, Biden did reveal that he is, in fact, going to support repeal 
repealing the Hyde Amendment, uh, something that has been very contentious over the past 24 hours. And really, uh, you've seen a lot of pressure, both from his fellow ca candidates who have been saying that they hope he reverses himself, and al also from other uh, groups who are involved in the abortion uh, rights fight. And Biden today is saying that he really, uh, seeing that women's uh, health is under assault, especially in states that mm -hmm. are pushing to pass bills uh, relating to abortion restrictions, that he could no longer uh, support this amendment. I mean, here's the question for us. Is, is Biden is definitely the front runner, okay? In the polling, Biden literally beats Trump in Texas. And I know I said this yesterday when, we, when I first saw the, uh, uh, the poll, right, uh, that, that it was stupid to look at polls this early. However, you look at polls when they come out. You want to see what's going on with the, uh, you know, other people in this country and how they're responding to questions about, you know, who are you for? And it does seem like uh, more conservative Democrats uh, love Joe Biden. They think that he's safe. And they think that he's moderate enough that they could cross party lines or that as an independent, they could vote for him or uh, that they feel like he's a safe bet. And so in Texas, Biden is beating Trump, you know, by four points. Now, Elizabeth Warren is literally tied with Trump in Texas. But the question is, is Biden a mess? Does he think that he's entitled to the nomination or is this progress for a Joe Biden who started his political career 50 years ago south of the Mason Dixon line I don't know but here, here is how he tried to explain it I'm gonna play the whole explanation because the front of it is obviously written and it sounds cogent and it sounds committed and it sounds uh you know it's got a little bit of passion behind it and then he starts fumfering and stammering and getting off script and we now see so many Republican governors denying health care to millions of the most poorest and most vulnerable Americans by refusing even Medicaid expansion I can't justify leaving millions of women without access to the care they need and the ability to, con to exercise their constitutionally protected right. If I believe health care is a right as I do, I can no longer support an amendment that makes that right dependent on someone's zip code. I have supported the Hyde Amendment like many, many others have. Because there was sufficient monies and circumstances where women were able to exercise that right women of color, poor women, women are not able to have access. And it was it was not under attack as it was then. What? As it is now. What? But circumstances have changed. See, I don't understand. I mean, there he was defending his support for it for all these years, you know, since the 70s. It's been like 40 years that he's been for this uh, Hyde Amendment, uh, barring uh, federal funds from being used by less better situated women, okay, to, uh, you know, uh, do their family planning. And now, and he tried to explain, and, uh, you know, his spokesperson was more articulate. His spokes spokesperson said, look, you have to understand that Mr. Biden is a Roman Catholic who has long grappled with his position on abortion. Uh, he once voted to let the states overturn Roe v. Wade. Seriously, he's, you know... Uh, but now it's become an issue again in this election because of the draconian laws that are being passed in the southern states again. I mean, it's like 1960 all over again. Uh, and that's when Joe Biden, you know, was uh, for things like the Hyde Amendment and for letting states take away a woman's right to choose what her body uh, you know she would be doing for the next nine months you know that my body does not belong to the state you understand nobody's body belongs to the state unless you join the military then you kind of throw away your civil rights it's just a fact but I, 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 I don't know is this progress or, 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 or is he in any way the wind blows doesn't really matter kind of guy all things Randy at RandyRhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Yeah, and you know, this this was good. This happened this week. Bernie Sanders went to a Walmart board meeting and uh, addressed the board. Despite the incredible wealth of its owner, 
Walmart pays many of its employees starvation wages. Wages that are so low that many of these employees are forced to rely on government programs like food stamps, Medicaid, and public housing in order to survive. Frankly, the American people are sick and tired of subsidizing the greed of some of the largest and most profitable corporations in this country. They are also outraged by the grotesque level of income and wealth inequality in America, as demonstrated by the CEO of Walmart making a thousand times more than the average Walmart employee. Well done, Bernie. Well done. So here's my point, okay? You have Joe Biden, who is the front runner, and a safe bet, some people think, okay? Um, you know this is an intra-family squabble we're having right now. Uh, I, of course, am going to wait at least until June 26th and 27th when we'll have the first debates, okay? Uh, we don't even know who's going to be in the first debates. I will tell you that there are 13 people that are guaranteed a slot on the debate stage. There are seven slots still open, but 10 candidates. Uh, it looks like uh, Governor Mon uh, the Montana Governor Steve Bullock is out. Uh, because of the criteria that's been set for uh, there's two thresholds to qualify for the debates so you either have to have um one percent of the uh, of of uh the a uh, favorability of one percent in the polling or you have to have had sixty five thousand individual donors right uh, and so we won't know till june 12th next wednesday who's definitely in and who's definitely out Right now, if I had to say who I like, which I don't like doing during the primary, as you know, but because it's so early and we haven't had a debate yet, I, I like Elizabeth Warren. I also like Bernie Sanders. I also like Kamala. I think when Kamala Harris shows up, it's like, whoa. You know, she just sets the whole thing on fire. Everybody goes, that woman is, is right. She is right for this job. She gets it, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, so, I, but I, I just, uh, I can't say who I would vote for. If I had to vote right now, I'm sure I could figure it out. But I don't have to vote right now. You don't have to vote right now. So we get to discuss who is going to be a candidate who's got policies that we're for, that represents what we think a 21st century America ought to be doing, ought to look like, ought to be striving for, and who can beat Trump as, as, as uh, you know, another issue, because those are the two, it can't just be against Trump because I think most of the country is, and they won't be elected president. So these people who are, you know, uh, it seems like there's a lot of them because there are a lot of them for us, because typically the superdelegates are pledged so early that you don't get a lot of people trying to run. That is not the case this year. We have, uh, you know, 13 that are in and seven spots that are open, which means 20 candidates will meet the criteria for a debate. Uh, I would like to see that debate. But... As it stands right now, Biden is not my favorite. He's a very nice guy, but he's got so much that he has to deal with in order to beat Trump. And his policies seem to be clipped from other people. It's just, I don't know. I, I, I don't feel that, you know, um, I feel like he was a great vice president. He's loyal, he's decent, he was kind, you could count on him, you could count on his uh, word meaning something. If he told you something was being discussed in private, it stayed in private. Do you know what I mean? I think he was an excellent vice president for Barack Obama. I know that they have a close relationship. And Barack Obama is going to have to endorse somebody at the end of all this. And, I, you know, I just don't know. I just don't know if it's uh, you know if biden was great for vice president and not so great for president or if biden is the safest most pragmatic uh, pick of all of them when you consider all the baggage biden's gonna have to stand on a stage and debate donald trump about his iraq war vote just like hillary biden's gonna have to stand on his stage and defend the fact that there were three other witnesses that could have backed up anita hill and he didn't call them as the chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. He didn't call them. And we're still living with Clarence Thomas. 
Biden's going to have to discuss this Hyde Amendment support that he's had for 40 years. And all of a sudden, a flip-flop right after every single person also running for the Democratic nomination uh, criticized him for being in the past, for living in the past, for, 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 for trying to penalize uh, poor women or women who don't have a hell of a lot of money or women that are disabled from being able to choose how to manage their bodies. I don't know. I think he's got a lot. Of, and, and the plagiarism thing is it's not going away. It's not going away. All right. Rhonda and Erie, I know you supported Joe. Now what? Well, you know, I, I don't really support him. I, I, I think of him in the ways that you just, I think he was a good vice president for Barack Obama. Excellent. I think people generally see him as a, you know, as a good guy, but, but come on now. I, I didn't want him to run precisely because of this. It's going to damage his record. And here's the other thing. Um, I really think that the next person who is the president of the, of the United States has to be able to get in there and make very real, um, significant change. This is what, what happens with the next administration cannot be incremental. They're going to have to go in there and shovel shit all day, every day, just to get us back on the right path. He's not capable of doing this. He's still talking about, um, what is, uh, Dick Cheney is a good guy. I what? saw that. I didn't play that. I have it in my archives. I, I reserved it. I held it back. I held it back because I don't want our intra-family squabbles broadcast, uh, you know, right now to, uh, you know, a larger audience. I, I just don't. Well, you're, but you're that, right. That, you're was, right. But that was sick. That was sad. He was sitting on a stage with Walter Mondale, who had to correct right. him and say, Dick Cheney was not a nice guy. Dick Cheney was the dark side. He said so himself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, my, but here's, here's, what I'm, here's what I'm seeing. We are friggin' scared. We are terrified. We and should And that's be. the reason. Well, we are, but, but that's also the reason that we're making these decisions. So, um, so I worked with a couple of uh, young women who ran for city council here. And on primary night, um, neither one of them won, but they got so close. So some of the things that we did kind of changed the game here in local politics. So, so you know, at the point where we saw that neither one of them was going to get there, but they got close. You know what we did? We started talking about, okay, what are we going to do next, right? What's, what, what's the next thing? Um, and a young woman who is about a little bit older than my daughter said, I, I really like Elizabeth Warren, but, I, I, but I'm so afraid that maybe she can't win because I don't want a repeat of the night uh, of election night when, you know, I was sitting there crying with my mother. I know. You know, I know. I get said, it. I just don't want that to happen. And I think that's why people are moving towards Biden, because we are all afraid. I do, too. That I, that orange idiot I, might get back in. I know. I feel it. I, I know yeah. that's true. I mean, it's obviously true. People think he's the pragmatic choice. We've had that conversation, you and I. I get that. But he's blowing it. To speak to Randy, call 561-270-3844. 561-270-3844. All right, so this is what Rhonda Neary was referring to that I said I had in my archives. Uh, it is Joe Biden on the stage at the University of Minnesota. It was a policy discussion. Uh, it was Joe Biden and Walter Mondale, and uh, they were discussing Dick Cheney. First of all, I actually like Dick Cheney for real. I, I get on with him. I think he's a decent man. Um, and uh, um, when I went to see him, uh, I didn't talk to him before. I went to see him after we were elected. And I went to see him at the residence. Uh, and he and his wife were extremely gracious to Jill and to me. Um, and, um, and he talked about how, how the office worked as related to the functioning of the office. And, um, but he had a very different relationship, and he was a powerful vice president. He had a very different relationship with, uh, with President Bush. And one, one of the things I, I, I learned from, and I, 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 it probably sounds like I'm making this up when I say I learned from, but I spoke to this man repeatedly about this job. And um, uh, 
Senator, uh, excuse me, uh, Vice President Cheney, he had his own national security team. Exactly. And it was real. And they were smart guys and, and women. And um, They were neocons. Uh, and I remember when I had recommended to the president, Jim Jones, who, uh, who I knew and the president knew. I knew him a little better uh, as our first national security advisor. And I'll never forget sitting down with Jim. And what Jim was worried about, with good reason, I could have kept a staff of I was close to 22 Ugh. folks. It was essentially a shadow National Security mm -hmm. Council. And I said, uh, and I remember the look on his face, and I said, Dick, look, I'm not going to keep that staff at all. I said, on one condition, and you should talk to the president about this. I have total access to the National Security Council. I can task them, too, through you. I can, I can bring them on, and we can do this jointly. Uh, you're the National Security Advisor, but the entire team you have will not be overshadowed. I will keep three people in my office. And I remember him going, oh, my God, thank God. But <clears throat> because what it was is about the confidence I had in the president meaning what he said and the president's confidence that I was not about to try to set up a satellite operation where I was going to take over line control of any, of any department. And uh, the guy who became the number two guy was one of my guys, you know, Tom Donlan, um, the people who were there. So it all worked, but I'll never forget the uh, Cheney, I think, I, I, don't, I don't know, the Cheney-Bush relationship at the outset was, uh, it seemed to me, to be more codependent. Um, and uh, so Cheney had a very different view uh, of the vice presidency in terms of how it functioned internally. Seriously, dude. Seriously. He had a shadow national security council, a shadow agent, run out of his office with 22 neocons. See, this is the problem. Joe Biden is going to have to talk on a stage about his vote to put us into Iraq. OK, he's going to have to talk about that. He's going to have to talk about the 1994 crime bill, just like Hillary Clinton had to talk about the 1994 crime bill and the mass incarceration uh, that had already started before uh, the 1994 crime bill was passed and accelerated mass incarceration of young minority men especially okay he's gonna have to talk about anita hill and the hearing that he was in charge of and how there were three witnesses to what anita hill was saying and joe biden wouldn't call those women he's gonna have to talk about this flip-flop on the hyde amendment he's gonna have to talk about plagiarism again because it looks like he's copying and pasting other people's ideas on renewables and a uh, 21st century uh, uh, economy built on renewable fuel and making fossil fuel a thing in the past. And he's going to talk. have to talk about his love for Dick Cheney. I work on the dark side, if you will. <gasps> Darth Vader. They made a whole movie about him. I'm sorry, but that's a lot of baggage. And I get that people think he's the pragmatic choice, but how is that possible? Uh, Joe Biden doesn't seem to want to put himself out in public all that much. Like I said, he's skipping Iowa events this week, and he says he's got a family thing, and he can't make it. And he skipped the California convention, of uh, the Democratic convention in California, which is now an early voting state, because, I don't know, uh, he, he just said he couldn't make it, whatever, and... This is a place where, you know, the very progressive Western part of the Democratic Party, where big, bold, exciting ideas were being launched, and he wasn't part of that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, is he a mess? Does he feel entitled? Or is this progress for him that he knows not to put himself out in the public all that much? That he, you know what I mean? I, I don't... I, I, I couldn't tell you, but if I had to vote right now, if, if the, the primary was, t you know, Tuesday, pretty much I think Elizabeth Warren gets my vote at this point because it's big, it's bold. And if you think about the message she is sharing, it's a message that crosses party lines. It is a populist message, except without bad ideas. It's a populist message with good ideas, the right prescriptions. You know, Trump ran on a populism that said, blame the other guy, blame Mexico, blame Mexicans, blame black people, you know, blame Muslims. 
That's what Trump ran on. That was his prescription for what ails us. And there were just enough racists in this country and just enough polling data was given to the Russian military intelligence units that they could be targeted and their votes suppressed. You know, that's what happened. But she is also dealing with the same issues, the income inequality, the issue of uh, uh, corporations having their, uh, their, 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 their purchased Congress members and their purchased senators vote their way for their benefit. That's why we got this crazy tax cut, right? And, and like I said, his stupid tariffs. And we're still waiting. You know, he just landed, they said. He may still speak from the White House tonight. He may still speak from the White House about the dumb, dumb tariff plan that's already cost average American households $831, which took away from the 930 that you got from his tax break. So there's only $100 left in your tax break because these new taxes have already started hitting you with his Chinese tariffs. I mean, it's just a sickening thing, but she... I think would appeal to the other side as much as he did because she's talking about the same problems that we still have because he failed to solve them. Because his solve was to point at Muslims and say, I'll ban them. His solve was to point at Mexicans and say they're rapists. And you know what the truth is? They're not rapists. And the truth is that most of the immigration is coming not from Mexican immigrants, migrants. It's coming from Hondurans and Guatemalans. And they've not taken away your jobs in manufacturing, but his tariffs do. Because automobiles in a Mexican tariff situation, in violation of NAFTA, will make cars cost more, thereby selling less cars. Immigration will affect your job. This is the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. Vice President Bondi, do you have some views on the, on the yeah, Cheney a, vice presidency? A little bit different, I would say. <laughs> um, he, he, was, he was kind to me. He was kind to Joan. We visited the home and so on. But he, he said early on that he was going to take things to the dark side. And I believe he really did. And he created the vice presidency as sort of a, a privileged sanctuary wouldn't respond to subpoenas. Hello. Stiff the Congress on who uh, his. He had a different view. <laughs> yeah, and he 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 was um, he worked with some of his key guys to bring about the torture memo and so on. Hello. I think those were were bad days for in the history of the vice president. I know all the things you said are right, but I I have a kind of a. Um, uh, I don't disagree with that. Harsh view of yeah. the man. Yes, Walter Mondale is correct to have a harsh view of Dick Cheney, who produced the torture memos with John Yoo and Addington and outed CIA operative Valerie Plame uh, and uh, lied about the need to go to war in Iraq in the first place, weapons of mass destruction, mushroom clouds, uh, had a secret national security operation, was denigrating uh, the actual intelligence that we were really getting from UNSCUM, who were the weapons inspectors in Iraq, and from the International Atomic Energy Agency, Hans Blix. Uh, so this is kind of what I think the debate would sound like, you know, on uh, June 26th and 27th when Biden gets up on the stage. I- I'm just saying, you know, Walter Mondale was more of a progressive than Joe Biden. And so this little snippet from the University of Minnesota, this discussion that they had about the value to our country of Dick Cheney, Uh, is very illustrative of the kind of landmines that will be greeting Joe Biden on the debate stage in Miami come June 26th. And that's why I keep saying you got to wait for the debates. You got to wait for the debates. I personally believe that the reason why 
Donald Trump partially was elected, besides for the racism, which was probably the key reason that he appealed to enough racists in this country, enough people who believe that blaming Muslims for some sort of a, 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 a Rust Belt situation or blaming Mexicans from some sort of a, 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 an agriculture situation was correct and true. Uh, there were enough people like that in our country, obviously. But the other reason, and if you, even if you left out the fact that polling data was given to the Russian intelligence, uh, you know, uh, uh, the military intelligence operation and the troll farms and all that, the other reason is because Donald Trump came off as big and bold. He's a con man. He didn't have any good ideas. He just appealed to racists and said, they're your problem, and so we'll get rid of them, and that'll solve your problem, which is untrue. And now people understand that that is untrue, whether or not they're willing to give up the racism. That's, you know, in the, that's on their, their brains. That's in their gut. That's in their, uh, that lays on their heart. I can't, uh, you know, tell them any more than I tell them already about blaming other people for a policy in this country that puts tariffs on soybeans is stupid and that you can't blame Muslims for that. I mean, I can't do any more than that, right? But what I can do is show you that we're about to walk into a situation where we have big, bold, brilliant ideas rooted in science and math that could actually turn the Rust Belt into a manufacturing mecca again by investing in manufacturing of renewable fuel uh, systems, whether it's a new grid or it's turbines or it's, uh, you know, whatever it's going to be, whatever it's going to be, algae or, you know, uh, carrying the, the energy from one place to another, whatever the technique is, whatever the methods uh, are, and there'll be multiples, uh, could turn the Rust Belt into another, uh, you know, have another heyday. It could actually do that. Taking uh, the coal country, and turning the coal country into a, re a renewable energy hub, okay, is, 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 is the promise of the 21st century. And you need people with big, bold ideas to launch it, to actually put it into practice. I think that's appealing to people living through all of this with a president who lied to them repeatedly and is now costing them jobs, literally costing them their jobs. People in, 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 in who, who do auto manufacture, they know, they know that, that, that if a car goes, uh, the cost of a car goes up $1,300 because of these tariffs, that they're going to lay uh, people off. They know that. Farmers understand that these tariffs were terrible for them. You know, you, you got, you got uh, uh, already China pl uh, you know, uh, placing, order, uh, placing orders for yellow... Well, Mexico is placing orders for yellow corn. You know what they do with their yellow corn in Mexico? They feed it to their animals. It's for livestock. They don't eat yellow corn. Only we do. But yellow corn is for livestock. They need it, right? White corn is what they have plenty of, and that's what they eat. White corn is tortillas, right? Uh, but yellow corn is for the livestock. They've already placed their orders with Brazil because they got to feed their livestock. And they don't know what to expect from this nutbag who thinks he looks good. This is his judgment. He thinks he looks good the way he is. I mean, it's just crazy. But they're losing their markets, and they get it. I think there's an opportunity, and that's why when people say, oh, I'm scared of Elizabeth Warren, or my friends are all scared of Elizabeth Warren, or they think that she can't win, uh, I don't think she's got that kind of baggage. I don't think she's got the baggage that Biden's got. I don't think that there are, you know, 50 years of bad decisions on Biden's part are, uh, you know, kind of, Go with them. Elizabeth Warren, she's an Okie. She's an Okie who put herself through school while raising two kids, got herself into Harvard through her own hard work, graduated, decided to become a professor there, taught bankruptcy law, for God's sake. And because she understood the raw deal that bankruptcy is for middle-class homeowners and what a great deal it is for guys like Donald Trump, and the disparity in the way people are treated in bankruptcy, she became 
a person that Obama went to to set up a consumer protection bureau. She conceived it, launched it, and headed it up. And it was working. And then he came in and demolished it and put Mick Mulvaney in as a part-timer or something. Like that. It's just like a, uh, she is not an establishment candidate. She's got ideas, and she understands math. She understands the situation Americans find themselves in. Now, the big thing that he's going to hit her with is this stupid, stupid Pocahontas thing, which is just racist on its face, number one. And number two, that's the story her family told her. I bet you there's nary a person in Oklahoma that doesn't think that they have Indian heritage. I'll bet you anything there's not one single human being in Oklahoma that isn't that doesn't gravitate towards turquoise because they think that they're uh, uh, from from Native American ancestry. And it isn't until they take their ancestry test that they find out that they're Swedish or Scottish or English or whatever. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think big, bold ideas are the right ideas for this time. I think people are open to them. I think they want them. And I think she's got those ideas. I really do. Michael and Boca. Brandy. Oh, my God. Jesus, oh, God. Oh. She's so <laughs> Pete. Oh, for the love of heavens to Murgatroyd. Oh. Never to Murgatroyd, even. Brandy, we both... Okay, let's talk turkey. You and I both know the phrase... Who can be Trump simply means, will that person vote for him as well? That's all it means. Will that person? The, you know, pointing to the next person. It's about, it's the insecurity that who you vote for is enough. It has totally destabilized people's right to just analyze what the hell a candidate is saying. Well, you now know, I, I got to tell you something. In the homework today at randyroads.com, just saying it's free, please do uh, take advantage of it. There is an article about the damage that fake news has done. Okay? Yeah. How, and the insecurity that people don't know what world they live in or what's true or false anymore. That's a huge problem. Yes. And, Randy, no one is talking about Russia. We're just talking about the horse race as if the Russia factor isn't right here. Yeah. It's not going to matter. Well, you know... If we I, don't do something about election fraud, yeah. if we do not tackle it head on. Next week will be a good week to talk about election fraud and gerrymandering and all these things. Because next Tuesday, Elijah Cummings on the, on the Oversight Committee... Uh, is going to hold Wilbur Ross in contempt of court because secret documents were hidden away and the federal court was lied to about the, yes. about the reason why the citizenship question ended up on the census, right? And so yep. that, that'll lead us into a whole conversation about election fraud. So, and next week also, the full House will vote on holding uh, in contempt Don McGahn and Bill Barr. It's going to be a doozy, a doozy. Have a good weekend, everybody. Stay tuned for the Randy Rhodes After Hours podcast.